Good morning, everybody, and I'm delighted to welcome Ian McEwen and Claire Armistead to the Charleston Festival. Ian McEwen is one of our most popular and critically acclaimed literary novelists, with six Booker nominations and a win for Amsterdam in 1998. He burst on the scene with his collection of short stories, First Love, Last Rites, which won the Somerset Morn Award. Since then, he's become our great liberal intellectual novelist, frequently taking a public stand in defense of civil society, both here and abroad. Ian's interest in science and his passionate advocacy of humanism have become strong themes in his work. In two th his 2010 novel, Solar, dealt with global warming, and his forthcoming novel, The Children Act, due to be published in September, puts ideas of adult responsibility on trial, with a plot that revolves around parents who refuse medical treatment for their sick son because of their religious beliefs. The, moral, the novel focuses on the role of the presiding female judge at the High Court. In a very rare opportunity, we're going to be treated to a pre-publication discussion of the Children Act and the moral dilemma at its centre between Ian and Claire Armitstead, book's editor of The Guardian. Claire was previously The Guardian's arts editor and has also been a theatre critic. She appears often on radio and TV as a cultural commentator. So I'm delighted to hand over to Claire and to Ian. Thank you, Diana, and thank you all for being here. Um, I now have a confession to make my, um, to open this, which is that I haven't read this book. Um, but none, neither have you. I did ask the publisher, and um, it's with the lawyers, which is interesting, and I think that we might want to interrogate that a little, a little bit further. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Random House lawyers are combing it for libel and invasion of privacy, um, and I'm in the clear. <laughs> so it's fine now. We have it's all fine. And we, it's, it, it, Ian is one of those rare writers who has become a news story, so when the rumour went out that this book was about to be published and what it was about. You know, that you have news, news reporters scurrying around trying to find out what it is. And we, we, we identified Siamese twins as one of the themes and, the, and the, medical, the medical thing. But you will be the first people. Are they the first people to actually hear a reading from it? Uh, second. I read it second. yesterday at my old uh, university, Sussex. Uh, so I read it to the students there a bit. But I'll read a little more here. <laughs> hey, well, Don't worry. I think we're, 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 we're not going to be able to wait. You're going to have to. Anyway, start. there's nothing very secret about it. It's just, it hasn't been published. You know. <laughs> so um, I'll just briefly set, set up this reading. It, it's about a, a high court judge, Fiona May, 59 years old, marriage in crisis, uh, and she's duty judge. Uh, until I started thinking about this, I hadn't realized that when you get nominated as duty judge, you're usually on duty for a week, which means you take calls day and night, uh, often from people who urgently need some kind of resolution. It could be a newspaper. In this case, it's a hospital trust. <laughs> and the hospital trust is wanting, seeking leave, as they say, to treat a 17-year-old boy uh, who urgently needs a blood transfusion. Now, he and his parents are devout Jehovah's Witnesses, and as you know, um, most Jehovah's Witnesses uh, will not allow themselves to be transfused by blood, and they draw on um, both Genesis and Leviticus and Acts, uh, various texts in there, which, which they take loosely to um, suggest that God has proscribed uh, the taking of blood into your own. Uh, this ruling actually emanated from Watchtower in Brooklyn in 1945. So, you know, it's not a, an ancient belief, and it's under a lot of pressure from, from some <laughs> witnesses who, who want to change. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses conveniently are able to change. They have more room for maneuver, say, than the Pope, um, <laughs> because they say that God only slowly reveals his intentions. And uh, if they wish to undo this prescription on uh, blood transfusion, uh, they can persuade themselves, which is an important human process, uh, that in fact God has now let it be known that, that uh, they, they were wrong in the past and they'd misinterpreted and now uh, they can go ahead. 
But as things stand, um, every now and then you'll read in the newspaper of uh, a court. There was a case recently in New Zealand, um, a, ho a hospital seeking leave to treat a boy. Now, in, in, English, in, in the English and Welsh jurisdiction, treating an adult against his or her will is trespass against the person. So no hospital will treat a person who's refusing treatment without uh, some overriding decision of a court. Uh, there's also the difficulty that if a child is close to the age of, of autonomy in this, uh, it, the closer, in fact, past the age of 16, uh, the wishes of that child become more and more important. So it's not a clear-cut matter of saying, well, you, you, only when you're 18 uh, can you um, make this decision for yourself. It's a grey area. Anyway, uh, I got rather absorbed in, in the whole business of what judges in the family division do. And in the opening chapters, I touch on a few other cases that Fiona May um, deals with. And I'll, I don't think I can put a glass of water up there, but I'll, I'll go here and read. So she's been married uh, most of her adult life, and uh, that marriage is under a lot of pressure. So running in parallel is her own private, as it were, family division. Um, and here she's reflecting on a case that's made some impact on her state of mind that may have contributed to the breakdown of her marriage to um, an academic at um, UCL called Jack. All the horror and pity and the dilemma itself were in the photograph shown to the judge and no one else. Infant sons of Jamaican and Scottish parents lay top and tailed amid a tangle of life support systems on a paediatric intensive care bed, joined at the pelvis and sharing a single torso, their splayed legs at right angles to their spines in resemblance of a many-pointed starfish. A measure fixed along the side of the incubator showed this helpless, all-too-human ensemble to be 60 centimetres in length. Their spinal cords and the lower ends of their spines were fused, their eyes closed, forearms raised in surrender to the court's decision. Their apostolic names, Matthew and Mark, had not encouraged clear thinking in some quarters. Matthew's head was swollen, his ears mere indentations in roseate skin. Mark's head, beneath the neonatal woolen cap, was normal. They shared only one organ, their bladder, which, mostly, which was mostly in Mark's abdomen, and which, a consultant noted, emptied spontaneously and freely through two separate urethras. Matthew's heart was large, but it, quote, barely squeezed. Mark's aorta fed into Matthew's, and it was Mark's heart that sustained them both. Matthew's brain was severely malformed and not compatible with normal development. His chest cavity lacked functional lung tissue. He had, one of the nursing staff said, not the lungs to cry with. Mark was sucking normally and feeding and breathing for both, doing all the work and therefore abnormally thin. Matthew, with nothing to do, was gaining weight. Left alone, Mark's heart would sooner or later fail from the effort and both must die. Matthew was unlikely to live more than six months. When he died, he would take his brother with him. The hospital was urgently looking for permission to separate the twins to save Mark, who had the potential to be a normal, healthy child. To do so, surgeons would have to clamp, then sever the shared aorta, and so killing Matthew, and then begin a complicated set of reconstructive procedures on Mark. The loving parents, devout Catholics living in a village on Jamaica's <coughs> north coast, calm in their belief, refused to sanction murder. God gave life, and only God could take it away. In part, Fiona's memory was of a prolonged and awful din assaulting her concentration, a thousand car alarms, a thousand witches in a frenzy, giving substance to the cliché, the screaming headline. Doctors, priests, television and radio hosts, newspaper columnists, colleagues, relations, taxi drivers, the nation at large had a view. The narrative ingredients were compelling, 
tragic babies, kind-hearted, solemn and eloquent parents in love with each other as well as their children, life, love, death and a race against time, masked surgeons pitched against supernatural belief. As for the spectrum of positions, at one end were those of secular utilitarian persuasion impatient of legal detail, blessed by an easy moral equation. One child saved better than two dead. At the other stood those of firm knowledge, not only of God's existence, but an understanding of his will. Fiona reminded all parties in the opening lines of her judgment, this is a court of law, not a court of morals. And our task has been to find, and our duty is then to apply the relevant principles of law to the situation before us, a situation which is unique. In this dire contest, there was only one desirable or less undesirable outcome, but a lawful route to it was not easy. Under pressure of time with a noisy world waiting, she found in just under a week and 13,000 words a plausible way. Or at least, the Court of Appeal, working to an even harsher deadline on the day after she delivered her judgment, seemed to suggest she had. However, there could be no presumption that one life was worth more than another. Separating the twins would be to kill Matthew. Not separating them would, by omission, kill both. The legal and moral space was tight, and the matter had to be set as a choice of the lesser evil. Still, the judge was obliged to consider what was in Matthew's best interests. Clearly, not death. But nor was life an option. He had a rudimentary brain, no lungs, a useless heart, was probably in pain and condemned to die, and soon. Fiona argued in a novel formulation which the Court of Appeal accepted that Matthew, unlike his brother, had no interests. But if the lesser evil was preferable, it might still be unlawful. How was murder, cutting open Matthew's body to sever an aorta, to be justified? Fiona rejected the notion urged on her by the hospital's counsel that separating the twins was analogous to turning off Matthew's life support machine, which was Mark. The surgery was too invasive, too much of a trespass on Matthew's bodily integrity to be considered a withdrawal of treatment. Instead, she found her argument in the ancient doctrine of necessity, an idea established in common law that in certain limited circumstances, which no parliament would ever care to define, it was permissible to break the criminal law to prevent a greater evil. She referred to a case in which a m men hijacked a plane to London, terrorized the passengers, and were found innocent of any crime because they were acting to avoid persecution in their own country. Regarding the all-important matter of intent, the purpose of the surgery was not to kill Matthew, but to save Mark. Matthew, in all his helplessness, was killing Mark, and the doctors must be allowed to come to Mark's defense to remove a threat of fatal harm. Matthew would perish after the separation, not because he was purposefully murdered, but because on his own, he was incapable of flourishing. The Court of Appeal agreed, the parents' appeal was dismissed, and two days later, at seven in the morning, the twins entered the operating theater. The colleagues Fiona valued most sought her out to shake her hand or wrote the kind of letter worth saving in a special folder. Her judgment was elegant and correct, was the insider's view. Reconstructive surgery on Mark was successful, public interest faded and moved on, but she was unhappy, couldn't leave the case alone, was awake at nights for long hours, turning over the details, rephrasing certain passages of her judgment, taking another tack. Or she lingered over familiar themes, including her own childlessness. At the same time, there began to arrive in pastel-colored envelopes the venomous thoughts of the devout. They were of the view that both children should have been left to die and were not pleased by her decision. Some deployed abusive language. Some said they longed to do her physical harm. And a few of those claimed to know where she lived. Those intense weeks left their mark on her, and it was only just beginning to fade. What exactly had troubled her? Her husband, they're in the middle of a row, by the way, and this is a digression. Her husband's question was her own, and he was waiting for an answer now. Before the hearing, she had received a submission from the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Westminster. In her judgment, she noted in a respectful paragraph, 
that the Archbishop preferred Mark to die along with Matthew in order not to interfere with God's purpose. That churchmen should want to obliterate the potential of a meaningful life in order to hold a theological line did not surprise or concern her. The law itself had similar problems when it allowed doctors to suffocate, dehydrate or starve certain hopeless patients to death, but would not permit the instant relief of a fatal injection. At nights, her thoughts returned to that photograph of the twins and the dozen others she had studied, and to the detailed technical information she had heard from medical specialists on all that was wrong with the babies, on the cutting and breaking, splicing and folding of infant flesh they must perform to give Mark a normal life, reconstructing internal organs, rotating his legs, his genitals and bowels through 90 degrees. In the bedroom darkness, while Jack at her side quietly snored, she seemed to peer over a cliff edge. She saw in the remembered pictures of Matthew and Mark a blind and purpose nullity. A microscopic egg had failed to divide in time due to a failure somewhere along a chain of chemical events, a tiny disturbance in a cascade of protein reactions. A molecular event ballooned like an exploding universe out onto the wider scale of human misery. No cruelty, nothing avenged, no ghost moving in mysterious ways. Merely a gene transcribed in error, an enzyme recipe skewed, a chemical bond severed. A process of natural wastage as indifferent as it was pointless, which only brought into relief healthy, perfectly formed life, equally contingent, equally without purpose. Blind luck to arrive in the world with your properly formed parts in the right place, to be born to parents who were loving, not cruel, or to escape by geographical or social accident, war or poverty, and therefore to find it so much easier to be virtuous. For a while the case had left her numb, caring less, feeling less, going about her business telling no one. But she became squeamish about bodies, barely able to look at her own or Jack's without feeling repelled. How was she to talk about this? Hardly plausible to have told him at this stage of a legal career, this one case among so many others, its sadness, its visceral details and loud public interest could affect her so intimately. For a while, some part of her had gone cold along with poor Matthew. She was the one who had dispatched a child from the world, argued him out of existence in 34 elegant pages. Never mind that with his bloated head and unsqueezing heart he was doomed to die. She was no less irrational than the archbishop and had come to regard the shrinking within herself as her due. The feeling had passed, but it left scar tissue in the memory even after seven weeks and a day. Not having a body, floating free of physical constraint, would have suited her best. I'm going to read one short section <coughs> from later in the book. A lot of the judges in the family division spend their time dealing uh, with divorces. Um, it was her impression, that is Fiona's of course, it was her impression, though the facts did not bear it out, that in the late summer of 2012, marital or partner breakdown and distress in Great Britain swelled like a freak spring tide, sweeping away entire households, scattering possessions and hopeful dreams, drowning those without a powerful instinct for survival. Loving promises were denied or rewritten. Once easy companions became artful combatants, crouching behind counsel, oblivious to the costs. Once neglected domestic items were bitterly fought for. Once easy trust was replaced by carefully worded arrangements. In the minds of the principals, the history of the marriage was redrafted to have been always doomed. Love was recast as delusion. And the children? Counters in a game, bargaining chips for use by mothers, objects of financial or emotional neglect by fathers. The pretext for real or fantasized or cynically invented charges of abuse, usually by mothers, sometimes by fathers. 
dazed children shuffling weakly between households in co-parenting agreements, mislaid coats or pencil cases shrilly broadcast from one solicitor to another, children doomed to see their father once or twice a month or never as the most purposeful men vanished into the smithy of a hot new marriage to forge new offspring. And the money, the new coinage was half truth and special pleading, greedy husbands versus greedy wives, maneuvering like nations at the end of a war, grabbing from the ruins what spoils they could before the final withdrawal. Men concealing their funds in foreign accounts, women demanding a life of ease forever. Mothers preventing children from seeing their fathers despite court orders. Fathers neglecting to support their children despite court orders. Husbands hitting wives and children, wives lying and spiteful, one party or the other, or both drunk or drug-addled or psychotic. And children again, forced to become carers of an inadequate parent. Children half forgotten, genuinely abused, sexually, mentally, both their evidence relayed on screen to the court. And beyond Fiona's reach, in cases reserved for the criminal rather than the family courts, children tortured, starved or beaten to death, evil spirits thrashed out of them in animist rites, gruesome young stepfathers breaking toddlers' bones while dim compliant mothers looked on, and drugs, drink, extreme household squalor, indifferent neighbours selectively deaf to the screaming, and careless or hard-pressed social workers failing to intervene. The work of the family division went on. It was an accident of the listings that so much marital conflict came Fiona's way that time. Pure coincidence that she was in conflict herself. It was not usual in this line of work to be sending people to prison. But all the same, she thought in idle moments that she could send down all those parties wanting at the expense of their children, a younger wife, a richer or less boring husband, a different suburb, fresh sex, fresh love, a new worldview, a nice new start before it was too late. Mere pursuit of pleasure, moral kitsch. Her own childlessness and the situation with Jack shaped these daydreams, and of course she was hardly serious. Still, she buried deep in a private mental domain, but never let it affect her decisions, a Puritan contempt for the men and women who pulled their families apart and persuaded themselves they were acting selflessly for the best. And in this thought experiment, she wouldn't have spared the childless, or at least not Jack. A cleansing spell in the scrubs for contaminating their marriage in the cause of novelty? Why not? I was listening to that, a word's propped into my head, um, particularly the, the first excerpt, which is merciless. You, it's a, you've got a merciless eye. Oh, I thought it in, was in quite the... warm and sympathetic. <laughs> 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 so, um. And I wondered to the extent to which that was because you, you've made the choice to make a judge that the, the person through whose consciousness it's filtered. I'm surprised that there isn't a larger literature in our fiction about judges because the kinds of moral decisions they make uh, fit exactly into the Jamesian tradition of moral discernment or, 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 or the Jane Austen tradition of moral discernment, uh, which we value so much. Uh, I'll come to Merciless in a minute, but um, <laughs> what struck me reading judgments is what literary objects they are. Some of these writers write incredibly well, and they have a very broad philosophical and sometimes uh, scientific reach, just through the accumulation of cases that have required medical and um, general scientific knowledge. Sometimes that knowledge fails spectacularly, too. I try to give a sense in that particular case, it was based on a real case, by the way, uh, um, presided over by Alan Ward. Uh, a judge recently re retired from the family uh, from the Court of Appeal. I try to give a sense that actually the parents are completely sincere in their faith, uh, about to face extraordinary pain for what they are visiting on their children, um, and 
completely reliant on the secular court to deliver them, as it were, uh, from even greater misery. Um, in the actual case, that, um, which is actually of two girls, um, I saw a photograph of the, the survivor of that um, severance. Uh, and there she was, five years old, very pretty, and standing with her very loving and proud parents. So the secular court, which makes its uh, acknowledgments of faith, uh, has to make decisions um, set out for it in the Children Act. And that's where I take my title. Now, the Children Act, in its very first clause, and this is the Children Act of 1989, there's been many others since, by the way, uh, says this, when a court determines any question with respect to the upbringing of a child, the child's welfare shall be the court's paramount consideration. Now, that sounds almost tautologous, but a lot flows from it. It means the child's welfare is the court's consideration, not the parent's faith, or not the parent's needs. The child's needs are greater than the parent's needs, and that's actually as dictated, at least in theory, how divorce cases are run, how uh, children's homes are run, how boarding schools are run. We now know, of course, there's <laughs> spectacular failures on all these fronts, but this, rather like Christian theology and actually what Christians do, there's the law and actually what happens. There's always a, um, the shadow, as Eliot would say. To investigate it morally, I, I, I would... Uh, I think you have to be clinical about this. Clinical is what I meant, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that is, you have to show mercy to, as it were, all sides and understand all sides. But finally, uh, and I think the Children Act is a very humane act, even though 1989, right, and Mrs. Thatcher was rising to her pomp, um, <laughs> written for her by a dreaded, hated class of social workers, actually. Uh, my ex-father-in-law had a hand in its drafting. Um, it's a very humane act. It's been copied in many places around the world. The granting of rights in law to children is, a, I think, a sort of one of those steps that civilization takes. Um, maybe the first thing to do is write it, and the, the next thing to do is to act it, you know, enact it, as it were. And so what the law has to do is, is be clinical in this. But it's anchored finally in that important phrase, and you'll see it echoed in all the judgments. I am bound, and they don't even say by what, they say I am bound to consider the child's welfare. And um, some of the best judgments then go on to philosophically speculate on what welfare means. Uh, interests, well-being, uh, happiness, and happiness is not only to, uh, to reside in this moment, but stretching forward uh, in terms of allowing the child as much uh, freedom of aspiration and, and so on. So the thing has been unwrapped by successive judges to become a very sophisticated set of ideas about what we want uh, for children. And that sometimes runs dead counter to what parents want. And judges must, uh, after much chopping and um, discussing, mu must decide. You, you have an interesting line there, which was um, Fiona argued in a novel formulation. And yes. I just wondered the significance of that, that phrase. It struck me that it was interesting both that because yeah. she's improvising, but also it, 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 it sort of, the word novel is obviously charged. To Doctrine of that. necessity. Actually, there was a better example I could have used, but it dates back to the 18th century when a, there was a shipwreck and some of the crew got on a whaler and they were at sea for many months, no, many weeks. And they made it to the coast of Cornwall. Uh, and in order to survive, they had to eat, uh, well, they had to eat, they ate the cabin boy. Um, <laughs> and um, they were uh, arrested on landing. This came out. And uh, they were tried in local court and condemned to death. Um, but it managed to extraordinarily enough, get its way to, to the Court of Appeal. Uh, and I think then was the doctrine of necessity formulated. 
and they were not murdered. They were imprisoned, but in fact, um, it was accepted by the court of the doctrine of necessity. It was either they all die or one die. I don't know if you remember the case of the hijacked plane from Afghanistan. I thought it was an amazing judgment because it simply encouraged more hijacks. But um, still, uh, they, 10 Afghan citizens uh, had hijacked a plane to Heathrow, did terrorize a passenger, um, but their lawyers argued from the doctrine of necessity, re reminding the court of the Eton cabin boy. <coughs> So that's where that stands. So I think when you think of the Eton Cabin Boy, you're in the world of Conrad. Aren't you? I mean, this is uh, uh, these are extraordinary judgments you should make. Or, or uh, the novel so brilliantly, um, those events brilliantly caught in a novel. Was it Paul Bailey's novel, Alive? Alive, uh, when the rugby team that's crashed in the Andes um, ate. But they only ate the dead people, you know. <laughs> and actually, the, the Pope instantly forgave them for that. But here, they actually had to kill, the, in the 18th century, they had to kill the cabin boy to eat him. So to what extent is a judge p picking up a story and running with it? Is the law actually an accretion of stories, which is selectively picked on by the people making judgments? Well, there are two forces. One is common law and previous judgments, and one is legislation. So those, those two have to be worked together. Um, one judge, um, Lenny Hoffman, said, um, your judges are human, um, and you could expect different outcomes from different judges. In other words, it, it is an entirely human process. There's no way around it. Um, we, we have a, a friend of our family just sent down for two and a half years for almost nothing. I mean, and we watched this case with horror. Had he been before another judge, he almost certainly would have got a suspended sentence. He got two and a half years. Um, so this is, yeah, it is a matter of, a judgment is a kind of story, um, self-justifying, intact, um, almost, like a, almost like a kind of delusion, a psychotic delusion, it's perfectly intact. Uh, you can appeal. Um, appeals are not often successful, actually. Judges of court of appeal are reluctant to undo <coughs> judgments of high court judges uh, unless there's really compelling reasons. And it has to be on a legal matter, not a moral matter. What if you're talking about the, the provisions of the Children Act, which is, which is sort of quite clear if the child has no voice, but what if the child can colludes in, in their own Those are taken death. into account. Uh, so they used to be called court welfare officers, now they're called CAFCAS, and I can't remember what it all stands for. Um, the older the child, the more seriously the court has to take into account its, its wishes. And that's where it gets very sticky, somewhere between 16 and 18, as to whether you say, well, this child is almost an adult, and in, you know, uh, this Jehovah's Witness boy is highly intelligent, uh, and can give cogent reasons why his faith says he mustn't have a blood transfusion. Uh, it, it's a difficult matter then, because it, it, it sails very, very close to um, criminal assault. Um, again, the judge, an individual judge has to make a decision. Very rarely does a court say, well, let the kid die. Um, uh, there have been a few cases in the southern United States where the judge happened to share uh, the religious persuasions. And most hospital trusts know that if they go to the court, they're, they're, they're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, you're dealing with real cases. You yeah. must have put a lot of time in researching these. And there's a sort of delicacy in the way that you can use information, presumably. Yes. I mean, that's why lawyers had to be involved. Um, the cases are, uh, as I said, they, they, are, they are a literary form, the, the, best, the best judges. And it's interesting the way judges read each other. Uh, I, I went to supper with a few judges, uh, and they, they all knew each other's judgments, stretching back years. Um, <laughs> and one uh, teasing uh, another said, do you remember that judgment of yours in the such and such case? 
where there was a dangling modifier in the very first sentence, and all the other judges went, oh. <laughs> uh, that, um, so they, they're a bit like writers. I mean, contemporary writers, they, they're, they're on each other's case, um, as it were. Did, did you have... I mean, there's issues of privacy, aren't there, for the, the particular cases? Yeah, you've, you've that, that's why up. one has to, first of all, transform the characters, their motivations, their circumstances, absolutely everything about the case. Um, and, of course, what, uh, I've invented a couple of cases, too, which are just... Um, yeah, merging of all kinds of different things from different quarters that c couldn't be identified. Uh, what's come, you know, digging around in this world, uh, you're always coming back to how human this process is, how disastrously wrong it can be. Uh, and then somehow how sometimes brilliantly clear and rational and humane it can be. These things run side by side. It's a bit like hospital treatment. Sometimes, you know, people come out of hospitals and it's just wonderful, our NHS, and other people are coming out with, you know, with the wrong leg off or, you know, uh, with a different view. Uh, I try to include um, one of the most disastrous miscarriages of justice in recent times, which, um, but again, I changed all the circumstances. But to talk of the real case, it's the case of Sally Clark, uh, a solicitor whose first child uh, died of a um, cot death and then had a second child and it died of a cot death. And the Crown Prosecution Service brought uh, a murder charge against her because it was felt to be so unlikely to have two cot deaths. And a medical expert who was not very up to date on his maths uh, was allowed to give evidence that since a cot death likelihood in any family was eight and a half thousand to one, the chances of two cot deaths were, was that number multiplied by itself. Now that is a plain abuse of statistics. Um, for a start, the chances of this particular individuals in this room at this moment are so colossal to one, you would say, well, it's impossible. But in fact, it's the case. You can't simply take one event and put a probability around it. You have to take at least two. So what are the chances of a mother in a middle-class, stable, um, financially well-resourced home murdering both her children? They are far greater than 8,500 times 8,500. So you need to put at least those two together. It's called the prosecutor's fallacy. And uh, when that was said in court, the society of statisticians and probability theorists all piled in. Um, but it was too late, and Sally Clark, um, and partly to the pathologist in that case, withheld information that the second child had a bacterial infection. And withheld it, actually, from the prosecution, and uh, withheld it from the whole case. So Sally Clark went down for four years. Her first appeal failed, largely because it was not known about this bacterial infection, and she was uh, only released on second appeal. Uh, and then she died of alcohol poisoning, and her life was wrecked. And it seemed to me like the trials of Job. You know, a mother bereaved of her children. She almost, well, she certainly didn't kill them. Um, she was demonized uh, by some newspapers. She was fed ground glass by her inmates in Holloway, <coughs> Holloway, uh, Holloway Prison. Uh, and it was the greatest miscarriage of justice in modern times. And the system uh, let her down. I mean, it really did. So, I mean, that, a whole set of unlucky events, terrible evidence that shouldn't have been allowed to the jury, and a pathologist, for reasons that were never really understood why he withheld information, did for her. Um, so you can't trust it. It is a bit like going into hospital. You might get a registrar performing on your brain who's never done this particular thing and the scalpel slips and, you know, you wake up, you can't move your tongue or your leg. Or, um, or you come out um, a new person you know, with a, a life regained. It's such a human process. Which is why I think it's of great interest to any novelist. Mm -hmm. you, your um, fiction has 
probably become more engaged with social and ethical issues over the years, hasn't it? And this is really full frontal thing, family and religion. These are things people mm. feel passionately invested in. Mm. And from the pieces you read, it seems like you take quite a polemical position, or your character does, within the, within the novel. I don't know if it's a polemical, but I think it's a rational decision. Um, I mean, Pache, the, the, the Archbishop of Westminster, I mean... The difficulty is not deciding what to do. I mean, any, any cab driver could tell you that one child alive is better than two dead. The, the interest for the law is to find a legal route to it. I mean, that's what's sort of fascinating to me. So I don't think there's anything plain. It would have been amazing, I think, for a high court to decide both children must die because the parents um, allowed it. Uh, that would never have got through the Court of Appeal because... Um, it would run against the spirit of the children. Um, what about you know, letting both children die would, would, would not be possible. Um, so I don't think it's a political position, but generally uh, about moral issues. I, I, I don't like to think of this novel as, or any of my novels as issue novels, really, but I am interested in the kinds of decisions we all take every day that, that are broadly called moral and define us as as individuals, how we work. Increasingly, and this would have surprised us, I think, if we were gathered in this tent in, say, 1970, but increasingly these cases devolve around the demands of religion. Um, and sincerely held faith sometimes runs straight up against either a child's interests or s social interests. Um, one of the cases I read recently and um, <coughs> refer to here two divorcing parents uh, from um, ultra-Orthodox Jewish community. And uh, the mother had rather gone against the grain and got herself uh, an education, got a degree and, and starting to teach in, in a secondary school. Uh, I think became head of English there. The community generally expected women and, and not to enter the profession. And sort of frowned upon. And actually, even the boys are not expected to do much beyond 16 at school and then study the Torah. But the two parents had very different ideas where they wanted to send their children. One wanted to send them to a, an ordinary Jewish school where they would, against the community's wishes, have contact with non Jewish children who watched television, had access to the internet, and all the things that <coughs> they prescribed. Um, the father was dead against this. The case was enormous. I mean, it was it ran for a very um, long time. The documents were huge, you know, fast. Had to be wheeled in court on trolleys. Um, and I think in that case, the court found for the mother again under the Children Act uh, that the children should stay on at school and get an education, possibly go to university, and then maybe return to their father's community if they so wish was in the spirit of the children. Now I'm going to open it out to questions in a minute, but just to give you time to formulate your questions, just one, que one question, which is a, something, it's a side question, and yeah. I mentioned it just before actually, which is, I've, so you've got lots of twins in your, in your books. You've got Vernon. Yeah, until you in, said in, that, I didn't know in, that. In a, but, well, I, I just sort of went on a t bit of a twin hunt, and you've got right, Vernon yeah. researching the um, Siamese twins in Amsterdam. You've got... Um, God, I've forgotten that. In Atonement, you've got twin cousins in the first section. Right. Well, this, I was wondering if yeah. there... And, and, and it's, mm. I was wondering if there's any significance in that, or whether you have a particular interest. Well, there might be significance, but I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because uh, until you told me there are all these twins, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, all I can say is, twins always catch my attention. I mean, if I see identical twin children, I, I can't... Is this not the case for all of us? We just stare in amazement. So, um, but also, if you see twin adults... Um, I lived... Uh, I bought the house uh, where... On Sang Su Chi lived in Oxford. And I bought it, um, so she was held up, as it were, in Burma. And I bought uh, the house of her husband, Michael Aris, uh, who was a scholar of um, Bhutanese um, sagas. And we became 
uh, I can't say friends, acquaintances. I mean, the deal went very well. And we like. I, I was very interested in what he did. The house was full of Bhutanese monks and lots of scrolls, and it was extraordinarily fascinating. But anyway, Michael, very sadly, he died a few years later. And I didn't know this, but when I, I went to the funeral, he had an identical twin. So identical that for the congregation, it was just <laughs> a complete shock because his voice, his manner of dressing, his mannerisms, everything was like, I thought maybe I'm about to become a Christian, <laughs> witnessing the resurrection. Um, so th there might be a full-scale um, whole genome copy of oneself. Uh, it, I, I suppose it's must fascinate us all, but how it's crept into my fiction. I, well, Tom Haley, as well in Sweet Tooth, tells a story. One of Tom Haley's stories is based on a twin impersonating his vicar brother. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <coughs> that's right, his twin. I must have been thinking of Michael Harris, actually. Because, I was wondering whether you were, yeah. Yeah, I must have been. Without thinking of it, I was thinking of it, now, if you see what I mean. Because um, in that case, um, he is an atheist, but his twin brother is a vicar, and the vicar falls ill, so the atheist goes to deliver uh, the sermon, uh, wearing his brother's frock coat, or whatever it's called, surplus, um, and delivers the most passionate and brilliant sermon uh, that the visiting archbishop um, is uh, really moved. and. Um, a woman in the congregation falls in love with him. Um, that was an abandoned novel, actually, which I then imported into Sweet Tooth. Ah. I thought there's not enough here for a novel, but it might do for a story. There we go. Um, right, it's over to you. Um, can you? There's a gentleman right over there. If you would, and then there's somebody in the middle. Do we have two flash, two mics? Yes. So it's there, and then one in the <coughs> middle. And if you put your hands up. Um, Quickly, so that we can keep the mic going. Yes, I'll get to you next. Yes, thanks. So the gentleman at the side, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I was very interested in the couple of examples, either by the blood transfusion or the Siamese twins, you had of cases where perhaps, either in your novel or in reality, um, parents, through their, who through their religious convictions, had effectively asked for their children to be allowed to die. And a court had said no these children must survive. How do the parents react subsequently? What's their relationship with their children who they effectively wanted to die? That's a very good, good question. Actually, that's what my novel is about. Um, <laughs> I, I had heard, and this is what drew me into this story, that in one case where the court had overruled religious parents' wishes, the parents sobbed but sobbed with joy, because the matter is taken out of their hands. They're not disobeying their church. They're not going against their profoundly held beliefs. But they, it's sort of cake and eat it, um, from a cynical, rational viewpoint, which is mine, actually, in this case. <laughs> but uh, th that touched me, uh, the thought that the parents would weep for joy. Um, and uh, that's what is one of the elements um, that uh, influences. I mean, the, the, this novel is as much about the boy in this case as the judge. Uh, and, and witnessing his parents weep is uh, key to what happens emotionally to him. In the middle? Um, I, this, I hope this doesn't sound incredibly naive, but. Um, do you not think to a degree the decision to, that, that gives rise to cases like this has already been made by the medical profession at the moment of birth <coughs> due to the advancement of medical <coughs> science, due to the fact that they are now able to sustain lives which a few years ago would not have been able to be artificially sustained? A uh, doctor delivers a child or children which, you know, really until relatively recently would never have had a chance. So somebody has already taken that decision to present a case for somebody else to develop? Yes, uh, but what no doctor wants or no hospital trust wants is a religious organization bringing a case against them for criminal assault. 
um, so if the parents have refused permission for the um, for a hospital to act, actually the hospital has to go legally to a to a court of law to override the parents' wishes because until the child has attained its majority, it's the it's the parents' decision. But if the, parent, if the children at birth had just been, as you touched sorry, I can't hear you. You have to take yeah, the mic back. Sorry. Take the mic. These please. babies possibly would have died without the aid that the medical profession gave them at birth. Yes, that's and, enabling. And, and a few years ago, the parents would possibly have accepted that as God's will or the law exactly. of nature or whatever. Exactly. It's, so it's, it's opened up the field, as it were, yeah. for these decisions. But and, this and decisions. what is your opinion on that? Do you have an opinion on that? I mean, is it, it's well, I think it's a, a wonderful thing that uh, children who might otherwise die uh, live. I mean, who could? Um, I mean. Where else do you go with that morally? I don't know. It, it, it's certainly the case uh, of um, premature births that uh, children survive, you know, even at 30 weeks, even earlier. Um, previously, they would not have. But there, it's quite clear that the the medical technology and the doctors are working together to save a life, not terminate a life. So this is the enabling thing. Absolutely, you're right. Those Siamese twins would have died uh, 30 years ago, I should think. But sometimes the life is, doesn't work out to be not worth saving. That sounds terrible. But sometimes the development just doesn't... I think this may be part of a conversation that yeah. should go on. I mean, it's a, yeah. this is a very complicated, yeah, long conversation. Very, very yeah, yeah. There's, there's a gentleman over there. Do we have anyone over there? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hearing uh, about the children who are victims, uh, the judges who make difficult, sometimes bad decisions, the surgeons in the hospital who may slip with their scalpels, I wonder if it isn't actually a call for what should be the, in the heart of all novelists and put in the hearts of all of us. That is, would you say, isn't it important for each of us to, to strongly to control our own narrative at all times, lest the story have to be taken up by judges, doctors, social workers? Well, I agree with that broadly, but when you're anaesthetized on a table, it's very hard to control the narrative. Um, uh, you know, if you're having a tumor removed from, um, from your pineal gland, uh, which is a very tricky operation, the, the pineal gland lying so deep in the brain, and yet you, you've already given your consent so that's your only active moment in the narrative. Um, you have signed the consent forms. Um, and the consent forms now, say for brain surgery, are you know, a short novel in themselves. Uh, no one apparently ever reads them. I've just been reading Henry Marsh's extraordinary book called Do No Harm. Uh, he says he's yet to meet a patient who's, who reads the consent form, because it's pages and pages long. <coughs> But yes, uh, we all want to control the narrative of our own existence, but sometimes events sweep in and we require the assistance of surgeons or, or even judges. So we've got a gentleman over there and then a lady in the, at the other side. Thank you. Um, can I return us to Show me where you are so I can yeah, there, there. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> can I return us to twins? Uh, and the twins we've been introduced to this morning of the judge and the novelist, although not identical twins, but you've drawn, you know, uh, shown us kind of suggested consonants between the two, the world of kind of story, community of storytellers, or kind of rhetorical devices and strategies, you know, which kind of would seem to link them, but also we don't think of them as, as uh, um, Siamese twins. I mean, there, we understand the kind of separation. I wonder what you think that is. Is it as you were suggesting at one point, a difference between legal decisions and judgments and moral ones, is that something like a kind of basic kind of distinction between the two fields? I, I, I'm lost with that question, sorry. Uh, are you asking me in relation to twins? Uh, yeah, I mean, sorry, the twins, uh, as I say, which have been suggested by the discussion of the judge and the novelist. The judge and the novelist? Uh, well, you're, you're suggesting uh, the uh, consonants between the two kind of fields, the fascination that you're suggesting that a novelist will uh, have, and the, the kind of 
world of fine writing on occasion, we, we are yeah. expressing admiration for the, the, the actual kind of language of a decision uh, and, and, and the kind of mode of argument, yes. Right. Um, so you, but you're also suggesting, I'm just repeating myself, yeah. that there was an important distinction between legal matters and legal judgments and moral matters and moral judgments. So I'm yep. wondering if that is the way one can, one can draw the distinction which we are, I'm sure, kind of conscious of between the judge and the novelist. The judge and the novelist. Well, judges have to constantly remind people, and um, Fiona does this in the first line of her judgment, that there is a distinction to be made between morals and law. They don't always sit side by side. And every now and then, we open our newspaper and are shocked by the irrationality of some decision, which is based on either legislation or common law, which has been successfully argued by counsel. And, and the judge has accepted that, or the jury has. Uh, I think in an ideal world, we would like a moral scheme that fitted exactly over a legal scheme. The trouble is that we're a world of different moral beings and we have slightly different, sometimes radically different moral schemes in our head. So the law is an exemplar, as it were, uh, a test case of our own moral confusion, or our, not confusion, our own moral differences. Sometimes, uh, as I say, we are shocked because a, a legal decision is not necessarily a moral one. Just coming back to the twins, I mean, uh, the obvious thing to say about them is they are a well-tried uh, literary device. I mean, Shakespeare uh, used them to death. Um, uh, the idea that, um, yes, one person could so resemble another that they could pass off uh, is one of those little... Uh, muffins that you know, can propel a plot forward, be it a, a, a masterwork like Winter's Tale or um, you know, a, a, a pulp crime novel. And so uh, it has a kind of uh, rhetorical uh, plot advancing uh, uses. But I still think that Maybe it's to do with, you know, maybe we're all Neoplatonists at heart. We do feel there is this other version of ourselves. Maybe we all crave a twin. Um, certainly I did. I had a, as a childhood, as, uh, although I had a brother and sister, they were much older than me. They weren't around when I was growing up. I, really, I think I did like the idea of having a twin. Um, not just a brother or a sister, but a twin. Um, and we've got somebody over there and then a, 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 a gentleman there. We got somebody over there? Yes, right at the, right at the end. Hello, yes, I really wanted to more make a point. I used to be a director of Guys and Thomases in the late 80s and early 90s, and we did have to deal with a number of issues, with Jehovah's Witnesses particularly. Mm. Um, and I have to say, sometimes the Jehovah's Witnesses actually decided that their child should be treated and yeah. just had to put that moral judgment aside. Where we did have to go to a judge to get an opinion, um, every time the judge ruled in favour of the child's life and the right for the child to have a life. But also, it's very interesting exactly what you said, that actually the parents were extraordinarily relieved after the operation because, in a way, their judgment had been taken out of their hands, but yeah. they were immensely grateful. And it only occurred a number about three times in five years. Yeah. But every time, without exception, they were frightfully relieved at the end yeah, of the day. I, I, uh, then Sorry, I can ask you a question. question. <laughs> uh, I, I'll ask you a question, since you have direct experience of this. Um, my impression in research was, leaving aside the parents' relief, it was the distress caused to the nursing staff of not being able to transfuse a child. Yes, absolutely. It was, was really... Yes. There is an extraordinary look, strong desire amongst doctors and nurses mm. to maintain life to, um, yes, that the, the, the child or an a, uh, adult should survive. Mm. They should do everything else. I mean, that's part of the Hippocratic Oath, really, that mm. they want children and adults to survive. Mm. Um, there were, uh, certainly I was part of a, of a level where I used to sit on with the consultants at, and at the uh, consultants had their own dining room and I was allowed yeah. to be in there. Um, and there were a lot of ethical discussions at the time around, and lunches 
very frequently about particular treatments because obviously there was a lot of research going on, a lot of cutting edge treatments. It was a tertiary referral, which meant that very difficult cases that couldn't be treated elsewhere were coming to the hospital. But there was a great deal of discussion about whether, where the edge was, where did you actually um, encourage the child or the adult to survive or help them to survive, mm. and actually where did you actually withdraw treatment, because actually it was quite a difficult decision sometimes. Yeah. I mean, the, the case that interests me is really in childhood leukaemia, which... Yes, um, absolutely. Yes, bone the, marrow treatments. The treatment exists. for which has not changed in a very long time yes. requires four drugs, two of which um, severely compromise the um, compromise the body's ability to make um, platelets um, and blood cells. So there's a real danger of the blood count dropping. Uh, and, and this is a cancer for which there's a reasonable chance of, of success. Mm. Um, I mean, there are other rarer forms of leukemia that uh, are fatal, but there are common forms of leukemia. Uh, you need to transfuse the blood yeah, so you must be very familiar with this, yes, in I order mean, exactly to counter the effects about. of it. So you're already yes. bringing the danger into the light yes. by, yes. by the very two drugs. Very uh, difficult. Because then you've got a slightly different moral yep. that the mm. Parents are usually, they've gone through months, if not years, of treatment. Mm. Um, tiny child, desperately ill, probably isn't going to survive. Mm. They've invested so much in that child emotionally, it's very difficult for them to make rational judgments almost sometimes. Mm. And sometimes you get to the stage where the children, or the, the, the adults, want the child to survive at all costs when actually the doctors really want to mm. try and withdraw treatment and make the child comfortable. Mm. Um, and that, it's a very, very difficult situation. Yeah. Very but but I agree, sometimes yeah. I think treatment mm. has gone on too far, I'm yeah. afraid. But it's, it's very difficult to make those very sort of decisions. Difficult. Yeah. OK, we'll go over to the other side. Yes. Good, af good afternoon, Ian. Where are you? Uh, over here. Right. right. Uh, you told a, a story, a, a case where there was um, there were two Orthodox Jewish parents mm -hmm. who, it appears, disagreed over what was in the interest or the welfare of, of their children yeah. with regards to education. And I think you said or suggested that it was held in those in, in that case that the welfare of the child was best served by essentially going to, a, to a, having a liberal education of some kind. This, the stories that you've told as a whole have been a, when a matter's come to court and mm. as a consequence of some conflict, perhaps between parents or uh, because there's a decision point because a, a child will die one way or another. Do you think that, uh, and perhaps outside of uh, the, the legal arena and maybe in the political arena, What's uh, source for the goose's source for the gander? In so far as those two children, if their parents or that child, the children in the Orthodox Jewish relationship, if their parents hadn't had that conflict, they nevertheless uh, would have been going to school, and a decision has been taken by a judge that actually there was a right kind of education. Do you think then that uh, that I in your view, views about welfare for children? ought to be more scrutinised outside the, the situation of conflict when they come to court? No, because I think that would give the judiciary and behind it the state such power over individual lives that we would drown in, um, we would drown in paper, let alone distress. One has to accept that the system accepts, as it were, that parents have the right to decide where, how and where their children are going to be educated subject to various education acts. They have to send their children to school. Um, and if they want to teach them at home, they have to go through certain processes to persuade authorities that they are capable of teaching their children. But generally, the courts very reluctantly take on the role of having to decide, when, usually in, in marital breakdown. They don't want this burden. And the judgments are, uh, are littered with phrases like uh, the amount to saying, oh, I wish we weren't looking at this, I, you know, which, but the, the phrase is the judicial reasonable parent. That's what the court has to become in the event of a breakdown of a decision making. And I actually have a paragraph here, sort of, you know, this, was a, this is a commonplace, important, private decision that parents make about where they want their children educated or how to bring up their children. 
what time their bedtimes are or you know, what kind of moral precepts they are taught or whatever. Uh, and only uh, in, in breakdown does the court very, very reluctant to step in, take this role. And it has to make the judgments um, in the light of what a contemporary reasonable parent would do now. So contemporary, it has to be, it, the courts accept that the, the mainstream moral codes change. Uh, so they have to devise this fiction of the judicial reasonable parent. Um, but no, we can't have the courts telling us, um, otherwise we could go to every moral realm of, of decision taking that affects other people, as the state would crush us. Right, we've got time for two more. I think we've got one over there and then a gentleman there. Um, Ian, I, I'm very impressed by your endorsement of the Children Act. Um, last year my mother died and I was very conscious of an extension of this whole issue which is what should we do legally about old people who were now the opposite end of the question you're facing, keeping a child alive, letting an old person die. It's kind of the same decision, is it not? Well, I, I belong to an organisation organization called Dignity in Dying which seeks to change the law on this. The law has got itself into the most incredible tangle. As I said in the passage I read, the law is quite happy to dehydrate and starve, allow doctors to starve patients to death. Um, for example, there are many patients who are in a persistent vegetative state. Brain scans show that there is brain activity in such patients. They might be feeling things, uh, unable to move their lips, or eyes, or anything. Um, and it's a, such a grey and difficult area. Um, if we could show that s such a person was in excruciating pain but unable to communicate to the nursing staff this pain, um, it would be illegal to end their lives you know, with a massive dose of morphine, but it would be legally proper to starve them to death or dehydrate them to death. So we, we're left now with the most extraordinary mess uh, befogged, I think, by the, the number of um, churchmen in the House of Lords who keep um, raising issues of the soul um, and only God you know, being able to take away life. We'd like to end up in a position uh, with carefully drafted laws that could not be abused, that people, leaving aside the PBS states, but people who are in, in command of their own faculties who are in great pain, chronic and acute pain, and who want to die, should be allowed to die. Um, I think slowly this is happening, more and more, uh, and I think it's happening in common law, more and more, but it's still, and Fiona properly recognises in my novel that the law's position on this is no more rational than the Archbishop of Westminster's, in that it, it, want, it would allow patients to die give permission to nursing, nursing staff to withdraw treatment on the sure understanding that this will condemn that patient to a lingering death. Imagine dying of thirst and starvation while people are walking around you. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. It's medieval in its uh, moral crudity, from my point of view. Yep. Considering issues of the soul that you just mentioned, uh, I believe there have been cases in which parents, because of medical intervention, have then subsequently rejected their child. Because, as it were, their child was, we say, contaminated by this and was no longer can be considered within their faith. So these other very poignant issues, mm. tragic issues, where the child has survived but is rejected, nevertheless, by the parents because they do, as it were, they broke, in a sense, they've broken faith the medical profession, the broken faith with their, their beliefs. Well, it's hard to imagine. I mean, um, one of the impressive, uh, at least on paper, things about Christianity is religion um, based around the notion of love. So um, it's hard to imagine, um, if, say, a, someone within the Christian faith who, who took such an action of rejecting a child wouldn't be in such fundamental contraventions from the basic moral tenets 
mostly held in the New Testament. Um, so, I mean, that, that's distressing to hear that, and I hadn't heard that, but that would seem to me, you know... Quite a famous case. In a, Quite a famous case, I think. It might have been yeah. in the 50s, I'm not sure. I know it's fairly rare. Yeah. Oh, I hope such children find, you know, loving parents. That's all one can say. Yes. I mean, foster parents or whatever. Yeah, but, but it's, um, it's just another interesting yeah, area. I another think, they don't... Parents are not always relieved mm. when the response. But certainly the courts can't away. be blackmailed by that, can they? <laughs> no. I, mean, no. Well, I think, I'm afraid, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much, Ian, for your fantastic presentation. We're very lucky. <laughs> Thank you. absolutely fascinating session that was as much about ethics and medicine, um, uh, the current society, as about literature. I know you've whetted everybody's appetite for September. Um, thank you very much, Claire, for helping to facilitate that. Um, I'm going to ask you all to remain seated just for another minute while we conduct uh, Ian to the bookstall. He will be signing books, although not the Children Act yet. Uh, um, uh, just before um, uh, Claire and Ian leave the platform, a, a, a few announcements. One, I want yet again to thank the University of Sussex for helping to support this event, for supporting this event. They, of course, as um, Ian indicated at the beginning do have a unique relationship with Ian because uh, he was their student. Um, and also just to remind you of a few things. One, if you haven't already noticed, we have delicious hot food, um, paella and uh, pizza in the barn area, as well as our usual other um, uh, uh, facilities for snacks around the site. But do go and experiment with the um, pizza and uh, paella sometime during the day. Raffle tickets in aid of Charleston are going to be sold, I think, um, in the marquee. I'm not sure whether elsewhere. Just to also to draw your attention to the fact that um, the Poet Laureate gave a reading here last night in which she uh, uh, read for the first time a poem that she wrote, um, she dedicated to Charleston. She wrote specifically uh, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the festival. Um, we've had those poems uh, printed in, in beautiful hand print uh, versions that are for sale exclusively during, uh, will be for sale exclusively at Charleston, most, most of which are bound to go during the festival. And there's some outside um, and also at the Charleston shop is actually published in The Guardian. Claire's Guardian today. Um, so thank you for being patient and for waiting just for a minute. And thank you again, Ian and Claire. Thank you.